Welcome to the Insights solo episodes of the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. My name is Marie Gervais. If you're passionate about gleaning leadership gems from others and delight at the capacity of the human spirit to survive and thrive, this is the show for you. After interviewing 100 plus guests from diverse cultures and professions, I have learned a thing or two about what makes successful people tick and effective managers lead. In each episode, I elaborate on one or several of the themes sparked by Culture and Leadership Connections guests and reflect on how these motifs can help us all be better humans. Join me as we contribute to the leadership discourse by elevating thought around the cultures and leadership themes that influence management and work. And now for today's episode. Hello and welcome to episode two of the Insights version of Culture and Leadership Connections solo podcasts. In this episode, I would like to talk about what I learned from 100 plus interviews about culture. In the last episode, I spoke about what I learned about leadership. This one is what I learned about culture. And you will see more themes emerging in subsequent episodes. What I learned about culture is something extra to what I already knew and partly what I already knew. So let me give you a little bit of background first. I have a doctorate in culture and learning in the workplace. I was born to immigrant parents, and we were a nuclear family with no relatives around us. And I changed many things in my life as an adult. So I changed the language of communication in the family. My family grew up with English and German, and my husband and my immediate family, that's my own family with my own children, grew up in French. So I had to learn French to do that. I also changed from being a Catholic to being a Baha'i. So making a change from moving into a more universalist belief system that still involves a lot of responsibility much beyond what I would have experienced as a Catholic was a significant change to me culturally. And then I moved through different profession groupings as well. So what remained constant was that I was always engaged in assisting with the development of capacity for other people of all ages. So with children of all ages, youth of all ages, adults of all ages, all of that has been consistent throughout all of my different careers. However, what changed was that I went from being in the service sector, which was in education, into the retail sector in sales. And then I went into the not-for-profit sector and then into the private sector. So I experienced all the different types of sectors. And I think that that gave me insights into culture that I would not have had otherwise. And it probably would have remained more on the theoretical level from my doctoral studies had I not had that variety of sector experience. And I think that that's important. So what I bring to these interviews is an understanding from a theoretical perspective, but also from a personal perspective and also from a career perspective. And the final thing that I bring is that my children have married people outside of their race and culture and religion, and that includes marrying into no religion or atheism. So we have a very diverse family. And so my experience of culture is learning to negotiate those differences in a way that is seen as really richness and that and helping the that diversity of acceptance to build a unified family identity or family sense of values because the family identity has fluctuated as the children got older and married and had their own children so there that's me i wanted to make sure you know that that's where i'm coming from so when i'm interviewing people i'm a very conscious of a lot of things that have to do with whether they are aware or not aware of their cultural influences whether they deny their cultural influences, and also how they live them as they make changes in their lives. It's extremely interesting to me. I never cease to be amazed and to learn from it. So here are some of the things that I've learned from all of those interviews. The first thing is that you really only become aware of your culture when you move away from it. Now, this is not a thundering insight. (laughs) Most people know that, but there are degrees. So if you go from a rural area to an urban area, or if you move from a small town to a medium-sized town, or from a city to a rural area, those are all cultural changes that you will experience as a culture shock. But you'll also experience culture shock if you move to another country, learn a different language, try and find work in that country. And you may not experience any of those things if you haven't done that. So this experience of being very uncomfortable, having to learn something new, 
that's not necessarily of your choice. You may have chosen to be there, but what you have to learn may not be your choice. And then experiencing other people's lives where they had no choice and they were forced into a situation that they didn't want to be in and they may or may not have negotiated that well. That's what really informs people's awareness of culture. So when I'm interviewing people, they will typically tell me things. When I ask them about culture, the first thing they say is their parents, their family. And people who don't have much awareness of the culture around them have difficulty imagining that their race or their country or the geography in which they live or any of their advantages or disadvantages actually influence who they are. So as people develop an awareness of culture, they start to see which pieces affected them and how. And they start to make more deliberate choices about what they want to keep inside and what they want to continue to nurture as part of their cultural influences. So let me stop for a moment and define culture. According to the way I work with culture in the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast, culture is any group. And any group can be two people, can be a small group, can be a family, it can be your profession, it can be your ethnicity, it can be your language, it can be your religion, it can be the society around you. In fact, all of us have multiple groups that we belong to in varying ways. We may feel like we're at the center of some of them or on the outskirts or on the outside looking in. All of those things are part of culture. And culture is fluid and changing all the time. So what you experienced at one point in your life, you will never experience again. Things change. If you leave a place and then come back to it, your memory of that place stays frozen and the place has continued to evolve and the people and culture have continued to evolve. When you go back, you're surprised because you expected it to be the same as when you left, but it doesn't stay frozen in time. It changes. So here we are interviewing people about culture and leadership and personality, their families, the influences around them. And so their awareness of their own culture is really important. And culture is not like just one monolithic block. So when people are aware of their culture, they start to say, oh, well, this really affected me as I was growing up. And this piece is something that has become more and more important to me as I got older. And these are the new things that I've learned to do. And it kind of goes on from there. So people tend to have either rigidity of cultural identity or degrees of flexibility around cultural identity. If the way they are and how they see themselves is very specifically through an ethnocultural experience. And remember, this is the ethnocultural experience that they have within their family. It may not even be from the country because if they have moved, if they've immigrated, if they've moved, it's really more their family experience. I'm just going to give you a quick example. When my mother-in-law was alive, she's a lovely woman and I learned many wonderful things from her. And when she was alive, she had a very specific idea about what was an appropriate French name because her family's from France. Her husband's family was from a Francophone community in Northern Ontario, originally from Quebec. And so she had very specific ideas about what would be an appropriate name. And she was complaining one time to me about how, you know, the French family were not giving their children proper French names. So I asked her what a proper French name was, and she went on to give the names of her children. (laughs) So she said those were proper French names. So then I asked her, well, what were the proper French names that were given to your mother and her sisters and brothers and the people around her? So then she started to name different names that we would not use today. Some of them are the same, like Anne, for example, continued throughout generations, but most were different. And then when we went back another generation, they were things like Belzimir. <laughs> they were certainly not what I would consider names that we would use today. So I said, well, maybe your idea of what's a proper French name is just a proper French name from the generation that you grew up in. And she was really shocked by that. She said, I never thought of that before. It's a possibility. And I think that we're all like that. We have some cultural identity rigidity and some flexibility. In some cases, we can learn from the places that we've been to and experienced. And in other cases, we stand on the outside and look in and remain unaffected by it. And so when I'm interviewing people for the podcast, I'm really paying attention to the areas where they have cultural identity rigidity and where they have cultural identity flexibility. And out of that comes the third thing, which is third culture. Now, in cultural studies, third culture refers to people who have moved a lot because of military or because uh, they were forced as refugees or because they had to make better lives for themselves and they left as immigrants. So all of those three things produce a culture that is a third culture. And so when I say third culture, what I'm referring to is you've got one foot in one cultural world and one foot in another, and you can see both. You feel like you're not quite enough of any of those cultures 
and yet you're more. And so what emerges is a third culture. And this third culture is becoming more and more common in the world because more and more people travel, more and more people live in different countries, and there are more and more people displaced because of war, because of persecution, and because of climate. And so as people are displaced, they have to find some way to make sense of their world. And socially, the only way to do that is to start to put things together. And when you do that, you develop a third culture. So you never lose what you originally had. It's not possible to erase your culture. You still keep it. And you learn something from the new culture and you build something entirely new that becomes third culture. It's specific to you and your experience. But when you meet other people who have that dual experience of having to put things together across cultural difference, you immediately recognize them and you go, ah, a friend. And so people who have those experiences tend to befriend people who have those experiences too. So they seek similarity and they have another characteristic. They feel rootless. They feel like they were deprived of some cultural knowing that they didn't get when they were younger. And I believe personally that this is also true of many Indigenous people who were deprived of their culture by it being ripped away from them. And this rootlessness is also a part of their sense of third culture. So it isn't always positive for people to have an experience of third culture because they feel like they don't belong anywhere and they don't have roots. And then when they look for their roots, their roots are often imaginations of what they think their roots could have been. So we're kind of living in this delusional world. But what's interesting about the third culture experience is that it starts to have other characteristics. For example, starting to see the rest of the human race as being part of the human family. So you're not looking so much at the differences as being a problem, but differences as being an advantage. Differences as giving you insights and knowledge and access that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So that's another characteristic of third culture. So there's the downside of feeling rootless and feeling like you don't belong. And then there's this side of you that you can identify with the importance of incorporating diversity. And the other piece to third culture is that people are able to apply things typically from one context to another better. So what happens is in your brain, you create more neural pathways. It's kind of like learning another language. Oftentimes, having another language is part of the cultural experience. But these neural pathways in your brain that happen as a result of cultural experience give you new and quicker access to information and problem solving that you would have had otherwise. Same thing as if you learn another language. So it's really an exciting space to be in. So that's the good part about third culture. And that's where the world is kind of heading towards is the development of third culture, where we keep pieces of our original cultures. We try to regenerate things that we have lost. And we also piece together something new that is beyond what we've experienced before. So the other piece of third culture that I think is less attractive is when people just move from one place to another and they allow the experience of difference to become their identity. So they go, oh, because I've experienced these 12 countries, that's my identity. When in fact, they haven't actually delved deeply into who they are. And they're sort of having an imagined third cultural experience because a third culture experience requires that you piece together experiences from the different cultures and create something new. It's really more conscious. You can't just say, oh yeah, I have 57 types of tomatoes and spices. That doesn't work for third culture. <laughs> it's kind of like a fake third culture. And part of that can also be denial. So people in third culture can be in denial in the same way as people who have no understanding of their culture can be in denial. And when you have no understanding of culture, it leaves you really handicapped. Let me give you an example. If you don't understand that something comes from your cultural experience, then you will automatically judge other people as being deficit because they don't do what you do. You're assuming that they have the same cultural experience as you, and they don't. So you assume that their actions and their behaviors emerge out of this same cultural experience and they're choosing to do something provocative when in fact they have a completely different experience and they may not be choosing to do anything provocative. They're just having a different cultural response than you are. So when you don't have cultural awareness, you tend to take things personally when they are not personal, they're cultural. This really matters for the workplace because you've got people being offended constantly over things that are cultural. And if they even just knew what they were, they'd move from being furious to curious and want to know more about the other person and about the circumstances that they grew up into and what makes them do and be and feel the things that they do. And that's how we come to unity. So that's the whole piece about unity through diversity. We become interested in each other through the differences. And then when we find the common human experiences, then we create bonds. And those bonds 
are often bonds of a third culture. So in the third culture, in its most positive sense, is this idea of building something new that can contribute to the life of humanity and the planet in a way that we have not yet experienced, which is being able to live like one human family instead of many families who are at war with each other. So that is something that I experienced through my interviews and also through my own background. And what I found very surprising was that those people who claim to be uh, diversity and inclusion experts or who run uh, multicultural organizations, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes when they were interviewed, they could not speak to their own cultural underpinnings, which really left them at a disadvantage because they're easily blindsided by the same things that people who have no cultural awareness will be blindsided by. You get hit from behind from things that you don't see. And the things that people who have a broad experience of culture but don't see it are blindsided by are the things that have to do with their own personal feelings, desires, and experiences that may lead them to anxious behavior or neurotic behavior, and they can't see it. They can't recognize it because they don't have a way to reflect on their experiences and make sense of them from their own cultural rootedness standpoint. So you've got the two Very unaware and very aware of cultural difference doesn't mean you learn to integrate culture into your life. And of all the people that I interviewed, really, I can only think of one person who is specifically and consciously integrated a lot from a culture that he moved into in a way that it transformed his sense of who he was. His cultural identity was transformed in the process. Mostly people don't do that. Mostly they experience something and then go on with life. But to experience it, reflect on it, is great. And that produces cultural awareness. But to experience it, reflect on it, and transform. Rare. Very rare. Interestingly, although I've interviewed over 100 people about culture, that's what I found. Most people are standing on the edges of culture, not actually moving in and exploring it or embracing any of the pieces that they didn't first grow up with. So we'll see what happens with the next 100 interviews. So one other thing that I just wanted to mention before I end And that is when people are able to make some reflections on their culture, they have three characteristics. One is that they suspend judgment of others. Or if they start to judge others, they immediately bring it back to themselves and go, ah, wait a minute, is this something about me or about them? So the suspension of judgment and the ability to bring it back to yourself and say, is this me or is this them or is it a little bit of both? That is one characteristic of people who make adjustments within cultural difference. As they do that, they grow both in self-awareness and other awareness, and they tend to wait and gather more facts and more information before making broad, generalized assumptions about a culture. When people first move somewhere, they say, oh, these people are all like that, or these people never do this. So they make these broad generalizations. But as we become more nuanced in cultural understandings, we start to see the person in the culture, the culture in the person, and then the things that are setting everything apart within that. The third characteristic is that people who feel the most uncomfortable in a new cultural experience tend to adjust faster than the people who feel comfortable. And that is really an interesting insight that I hadn't thought I would find out. So if you are feeling really ill at ease in a situation, really uncomfortable in a situation, you are much more likely to adapt quickly to the cultural context so that you feel more comfortable because the human nervous system can't stand being that dissonant, can't stand being in that state of discomfort for very long. So you look for ways to understand the culture and to understand your place in the culture. And that culture can be a new work experience. It can even be a different floor in the same company where you're working. But that sense of discomfort usually helps people to adapt faster. The other thing it does is the opposite. So if the discomfort is so high that they can't tolerate it, they leave and they say, this is not the place for me. Now, usually the discomfort doesn't come from the culture per se. It comes from a clash of values. So when people leave a cultural experience without trying to make sense of that, it's because they feel that their values have been compromised. It may or may not be true, but that's the case. Maybe I'll give you a more concrete example. Let's say you were captured by a terrorist organization and tortured. Now, in a terrorist organization, uh, torture and treating people disrespectfully to hurt them is part of the value. That's what gives you status. If you are 
outside of that organization and you're in a culture where people get status by being kind and helpful to each other. Those two sets of values are like fire and water. They're antithetical to each other. They can't sustain each other. They can't coexist. You either tune out or leave or die. So when people have a cultural experience that is uncomfortable, they may react in the same way because their nervous system may not be able to tolerate it. And that can be a result of the previous trauma that they've experienced in their lives. So if you've experienced trauma, like being tortured, being captured, being kidnapped, that kind of trauma, you're not just going to get over it. It's going to affect you unless you work with it and learn to heal it and get seek outside help in whatever resources are available to you at the time. And it will continue to influence your behavior. And so what I have seen in people that have extreme cultural rigidity is that their own traumas remain hidden to them. They haven't healed and they stay stuck in this rigidity. But that's the way they are. And that's where they're at in their lives. So it's not my place to judge them. And if I find when I'm interviewing somebody that the cultural rigidity is very strong, I don't provoke it. I just leave it and move on to another question (laughs) so that they can save face. Because we're all on a different journey. And at any point, any one of us may dig our heels in or cave and not be able to do something that we're proud of. So who knows how we're going to react? And it's best to try and suspend judgment on these situations because we don't know how we'd be had we experienced the same things the other people are experiencing. So that, in sum, is the basis of what I discovered from interviewing over 100 people about culture. Let me do a quick recap. Awareness of culture happens usually when you leave that culture and experience it from the outside. So you can look in on your own culture. People can have rigidity of cultural identity or flexibility of cultural identity. This could be a result of past traumas, even past intergenerational traumas that they're not aware of. What is developing is a third culture around the world. There is the real third culture, which is people trying to piece together pieces of their cultural experience into a new experience and then look for others that also are doing the same thing. Or the fake third culture, where people are in denial of their own cultural underpinnings and just try to superficially put together their travel experience as if it were a cultural influence. This, of course, is just my take on it, and you can agree or disagree. But that's what I've noticed as I went through the interviews. Also, the other piece is that people who claim to be experts in an area tend to be less credible than the ones who simply have reflected more carefully and more consciously about the role of culture in their lives. And finally, when people become more and more culturally aware, they suspend judgment They become more self-aware and other-aware, and they seek to remedy the discomfort that they experience in a cultural experience. If they can't remedy it, it could be because it's a traumatic experience and it's antithetical to their values, or because they have experienced trauma in the past that they haven't been able to heal. And so I will leave you with that, my musings on culture as a result of all of these experiences and interviews. I hope you found them useful. And I would love to hear your own ideas about them because getting feedback makes the whole podcast experience wonderful. Thank you for listening. Make sure you share the episode with anyone you think would benefit from it. And may culture and leadership connections continue to guide and inspire your day. Newsflash. Listeners can now interact with Culture and Leadership Connections podcast by leaving a voice or text message on Fan List. It is a fun and quick way to let me know what you liked, ask a question, or leave a suggestion. I will feature some of the voice messages on upcoming episodes. You might be surprised to hear your own voice, but only if you leave a message, of course. So to leave your personal message or your question, go to shiftworkplace.com slash podcast and click on the Fan List link to leave it. I can hardly wait to hear what you have to say.